All right, one thing that's important to understand is that when we go over these examples, the point isn't just to teach you how to do the one thing that we did in the example, but you should be able to take what we've learned in one example and apply it to other similar situations. So before we get on to our next main topic, um, which we're going to talk about dealing with forms and creating functions and so on, I'd like to talk about how you would do sort of an image gallery where you would have a set of thumbnails and then a big picture in the middle. Uh, and as you moused over the thumbnail, the big picture would change. Um, so if we had something like this, where we had thumbnail, 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 and then big picture. Let's say each of these look like this. Image src equals one thumb.jpg. Dot dot dot. And so on. This one was two thumb.jpg. And let's say the bigger versions of the picture were respectively one dot jpeg, two dot jpeg, three dot jpeg, four dot jpeg. And let's say the HTML for this guy would be image source, whoops, source equals, maybe initially it's one dot jpeg. So that's the big image, and each of these are the little images. So as we did a mouse over on this, how would this work? Well, would apply the same ideas that we learned in the other one. What did, what did we learn in the other example of the menus? We learned, first of all, that user events get the ball rolling, right? That's what starts things off. And in this case, the user event would be on mouse over. At least that's how I presented it. You could make it so that when you clicked on it, it would do the same thing. So either on mouse over on click would be the event. What do we need to do when we mouse over? Well, we need to point to this image, all right? Because as we mouse over these various thumbnails, this is the image we want to change. So if we put our mouse over 2T, we want the big image to change to 2, and so on down the line. All right. Now, there's five images on this page. We have to tell it specifically which image we want to swap out. All right. And the best way to uniquely identify to point to one thing on the page is via an ID. So we could do something like this. ID equals big pick. So we've given that an ID so that we can point to it. Once we point to it, then we can write code to access its properties. All right? So right over here. How do we point to things? Typically, we say document. That means something on the web page. Get element by ID. That says, I want specifically the thing on the page that has this ID. I'm not going to swap out this image, this image, or this image, or that image. I'm going to swap out that one. So therefore, I need the ID of that. What do we want to change about this? What property do we want to change about that image tag? The source. Right? Now, if you remember, when we did the menus, we pointed to the element, then we said we wanted to change the style of it. And what about the style did we want to change? We wanted to change the uh, display from um, none to inline block, I think we made it, or something like that. So when we did that, we said dot style dot the name of the attribute. This, because this is not part of
part of the style, this is a regular HTML attribute, we just put .src. That's the property. Then we put equals and the value that we want to change it to. So in this case, it would be 2.jpg. Close it after the ending single quote for the name. We have a semicolon. Then we have a double quote that ends our whole JavaScript expression. And that would be the code to swap out that big image when you put your mouse over that thumbnail. And then you'd simply repeat that three times or for however many thumbnails you have. So what's in common about this? What's in common about this is that line looks about the same. The only difference is, number one, we're dealing with HTML and not style. So when we dealt with style, it was the same up to here, and then we said style display. So we want to change an HTML attribute, so we simply say .src equals, and then we have the value that we want to change it to, just like we did with the display. So it's important to be able to recognize and to take from these things, not just the specific example that we do, but to see the bigger picture and see how the same technique we use to do this, we can use to do something that's a little bit different. So if we want to change a HTML attribute, we point to the element that we want to change it to, then we say dot and then the name of the attribute. Now, oftentimes, the name of the attribute is the same thing that's in our HTML code. For example, it's not a coincidence that this SRC matches SRC. That's the same property. We're just setting it two different ways. In one case, we're setting it through our HTML when we initially create the page. And in our JavaScript, we're setting it dynamically based on the user's action. But it's the same source property. All right? Now, with style, it's the same thing. If you remember before, we said style display. Well, in our style sheet, there was an attribute called display. Right? So same attribute. And it's going to be spelled the same. And all the values are going to be the same. The only one exception to this is if the style attribute contains a dash. So, for example, in our CSS, we could have something that looked like this. Pound sign menu, background, dash color, green. If we were to write that in a JavaScript ex uh, expression, we would say document, get element, by ID menu all right dot style because it's part of the style and then we would say background color without a dash but with the first word lowercase the second and any subsequent words would be uppercase that's called camel case I can say equals red or whatever. So the important things that we've learned so far about JavaScript. Number one, user events trigger those things. And the main user events that we're going to look at are on mouse over, on mouse out, on click. But there's other events too. On key down, for example, we could do or on key up, so that as a user types in, we do some sort of process. Again, the classic example of that is if you go into Twitter and you start to compose a tweet, as you start typing, it shows you how many characters you have left. It's like that also for sometimes comment sections on a web page. You might have 200 characters to write a comment, and it will tell you um, as you're typing in um, how good uh, or how many characters you have left. The other thing I've seen it used for is passwords. All right. In other words, as you type your password, it shows you the strength of your password. 
based on some criteria. You know, so if you type in one character for your password, it'll tell you, well, your password's weak. Then if you type in two characters, it'll say, well, it's still kind of weak, and then so on. And then it looks to see if you have a mix of characters and numbers and blah, 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 and then it tells you. But it does that to you actually as you are typing. All right, so that's based on some JavaScript that happens as you press the key. All right. We'll keep coming back to this. We'll, we'll cover JavaScript throughout the semester. All right, we have a section about JavaScript at the beginning of the class, and we're not done with that section yet. Um, but we will keep coming back to this throughout the semester and learning more JavaScript stuff using different events, using different attributes and all that. But right now, I want to do something specific with JavaScript. And I want to do... Um, JavaScript um, associated with forms because JavaScript is often used with forms for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, it's used with forms uh, to do validation of the forms to make sure that um, you uh, you uh, can can do uh, the calcul uh, to, to make sure that the, the data you entered is valid so that you can um, you can. Uh, submit it to the server so the server can do its thing. Because, for example, if you try to place an order but you don't have a credit card number, your order's doomed. The server's not going to be able to accept it. So why even let it get submitted to the server if the client side already can have the code in there look to say, hey, if there's no credit card number, it's not valid. We can also use JavaScript to do some calculations. And we can use them to do calculations if they're not really resource intensive. For example, a, a calculation to show you your bank balance, well, that requires you to have access to the bank database and stuff like that. So that's sort of a resource intensive calculation. But some calculations are like strictly math, right? I mean, they're just like, like we're going to do, which the example we're going to do, we're going to do, uh, um, uh, conversion from centigrade to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to centigrade. That's just math. That doesn't require any um, special resources other than the fact that you know what the equation is to calculate Fahrenheit to centigrade. There's another one that I actually saw. Um, it's kind of amusing. I, I guess it depends on your definition of amusing, but alright, let's say we want to make a PVC flute, alright, you can actually take for a dollar, you know, and get a section of PVC flute, a uh, PVC pipe at a hardware store, and then you can drill holes in it. You can actually make a flute. All right? Now, where you put the holes and all that, I mean, that's science, right? I mean, you know, physics, the waves, blah, blah, blah. Go ask a physics professor. Go ask Stephen Hawking how you do this. But there's some formula to, that says that if you put the holes here, here, and here, you get the right notes. Whereas if you put them in different places, you get different notes. That's all math, right? So, I was playing around with this over winter break, and I saw this page, which tells me, based on some criteria, It's defaulting to a one-inch pipe that has an inside diameter of 0.824 inches and a wall thickness of 1.13. That doesn't add up to exactly an inch, but whatever. Then you can say, well, what key do I want it in? Maybe I want it in the key of C. I click the calculate button, and it shows me the distance from the end of the flute that I put to get the different notes. C 
So, and what the frequency is. All right. And these frequencies correspond to um, different notes. Um, and I'm not smart enough to remember what those frequencies are. I think 440 is an A, for example. The rest of them, I don't, I don't know what they are. But they do that calculation. This is all math, right? This doesn't require looking up in a database. If you have these numbers, and if you know the physics, you can do this calculation without looking up anything in a database or anything like that. So this is a perfect candidate of something that can happen via JavaScript. Why bother the server to do this calculation when you can put the calculation right inside the JavaScript? Because it's a simple enough calculation to do. It's not very resource intensive. All right? So remember, that's our, how do I want to say it? That's our criteria for writing JavaScript, right? We want our JavaScript to do functionality that isn't resource intensive. All right? doesn't take looking something up in a database. Usually when I talk about resources, I'm talking about looking something up in a database, but it could be some other stuff as well. All right? It's not hard, in other words. It's not something that takes a lot of effort. That's something that requires a server to do. All right? We can do it just as well. Think of the menus, right? Why, you know, it would be absurd to think of sending a request to the server to get back a page that displays the basketball menu on ESPN, right? The client can do that just as well, and it's a win situation all the way around, right? The user gets an immediate response to their request. They put their mouse on the basketball link, boom, the basketball submenu comes up. The server is a win for because the server doesn't have to hassle handling that little request that the client can take care of just as well on its own, all right? Same idea on this page. This page... Once it's loaded, the calculations are there, embedded in the JavaScript. We could probably see them if we did a view source. Oh, looky here. They've even documented it well. Wow, good job. <laughs> All right. But, I mean, this shows you the calculation that you go through. All right. Probably anything, something you could get from some college physics textbook. I would imagine. All right? Okay. So, are centigrade to Fahrenheit calculations going to be an example of that? All right? And again, we're going to see the three things that go into play for doing um, any client-side web page. We're going to see HTML, we're going to see CSS, and then we're going to see JavaScript. All right? At least in our final version, we'll see all of these. One thing I'm curious about is what if I leave one of these fields blank, or two fields blank? Well, okay, I found a flaw in this. All right? It doesn't tell me that I've left something blank. Well, what do you want for nothing, right? It gives me NAN. Any idea what NAN means? Go ask your Aunt Nan for this. It means not a number. In other words, there is not a number in there, so it couldn't do the calculation. All right? It would be better to give us a, a more um, user-friendly error message because, I mean, it's obvious here that I didn't put anything in, so, I mean, I shouldn't expect results. But if I inadvertently, for example, pointed out, uh, typed in that the inside diameter was 1.2 and I used a comma, instead of a period, like accidentally. It's telling me NAN, and I could look at that if I didn't realize I typed the comma by mistake. It could be like, I typed it in right, you know. Whereas if I gave a user-friendly error message, then it would be obvious, hey, you didn't put a numeric value in the one of the input fields. All right, so we're going to do a simple Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. All right. And we're going to do it a couple different ways, just for the heck of it, all right? So I'm going to start out opening Notepad. Or we'll open Notepad++, plus plus. what the heck. Here's 
my web page. So I'm going to put the stuff in that is on every web page. Again, I hate to pull the do as I say and not as I do bit, but the pages you turn in should look like completed web pages. The examples I do in class are just meant to illustrate a certain point. So, it doesn't mean that it needs to have an award-winning design, but spend put some effort for it. If you really want to annoy me, take one of my examples and don't even change the variable names. So like maybe you're doing a tuition calculation and I'm doing a temperature calculation and like instead of in county it says Celsius or something like that. That's a good way to really annoy me, all right? And um, more than just an annoyance, that's horrible programming because what if someone comes back later on to try to maintain that code and they look and they say, this person lives in the county of Fahrenheit? What's, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So please make some effort. All right. Now, our Fahrenheit conversion isn't going to be extremely extensive, but it's going to take a couple lines of code, especially when we put the validation in. So I'm going to create a function for it. So I'm going to create my text box. I'm going to give it an ID. I'm going to create a button. submit button. Alright? This is a plain old button. Those of you that have me in the HTML class know that I talk about submit buttons. That's what sends code to the server to be processed. Alright? We're not sending anything to a server. We are simply using our JavaScript to do the calculation. So we're using the button to sort of invoke a piece of JavaScript. So therefore, we're not submitting to a server, therefore this does not need to be a submit button. Likewise, I don't even really need a form tag, but my compulsiveness is getting in the way here, and I'll put a form tag in anyhow, even though it would probably, well, it would work without having it. Now, on click equals, I could put the string of JavaScript steps to do this calculation up here, just right here, as part of the on click event. But I know that at least it's going to be maybe three, two, three lines. It's going to be more than one line. So what I would do is I would do something like this. I put instruction one semicolon, instruction two, and so on down the line. That gets very hard to read very, very, very quickly. So what we typically do, if we have one line of JavaScript code, we can do it like we did the example last time. On click equals, boom, there's the JavaScript. However, when we're calling multiple lines, it's best to group them together and put them in a function. All right? Now, there's other reasons for putting things in functions too, but this is the first reason we're going to see. So, I'm going to give a name to my function, convert temperature. And I'm going to give a value.
more on the page. Keep in mind, all I'm doing now is I want to get my HTML set. And then I'll worry about the JavaScript. Sort of a common practice. You do a piece at a time, get that working, and then you can enhance it and so on. I'm not going to worry about CSS right this minute. If I look at this, if I go and save it, I'll save it on the desktop, and I will say it's an HTML file. And I'll call it temperature.html, save, and I'm ready to go. Open with Google Chrome. There it is. Of course, nothing happens, right? Nothing happens because that's a plain old button. And plain buttons don't have any default behavior. Plain buttons only have the behavior that we code for them via JavaScript. So that's going to be our next step. So I have a function called onClick. I'm going to go and I'm going to put that in the head section in a script tag. script tag is sort of like the style tag, right? The style tag tells the browser that the code within the style tag is not HTML, but is CSS code. Well, the script tag tells the browser that this code is not HTML, but is JavaScript. So the browser knows not to try to display it as a web page. All right. Now I'm going to declare my function here, and it has to match the name, and it has to be case sensitive. It has to have the parentheses after it. The parentheses is where we're going to place arguments, which are like parameters for the function. This particular function doesn't need any arguments, so the parentheses will be empty, but they're still, they still need to be there. So go up here that says function. temperature then I put the braces in and one thing that's nice about notepad++ as opposed to just plain old notepad is notice how the braces are color coded this is particularly important when you have a complicated function that has a whole bunch of statements in it because it shows you that this ending brace belongs to this starting brace. In JavaScript, these braces are used to group stuff together that go together. So a function like this is a group of JavaScript statements. So I could have multiple functions on my page if I had multiple things I wanted to do. And each function would contain a group of statements. These braces sort of say where the function starts and where the function ends. So everything between those braces, that's the function known as convert temperature. All right? The stuff outside of those braces is something else. So we'll use the braces uh, several times, all right, in this class. Uh, and we also use them in PHP for the same purpose. The syntax of PHP is similar to the syntax of JavaScript, which is a good thing, all right? But this simply tells us that the convert temperature function is all the statements that go from here to here to here. All right. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I am just going to do this in little itty bitty pieces. All right. I'm not going to try to write the whole function all at once. I'm going to do this in tiny pieces. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the button correctly calls this function. And I could do this a few different ways. I'm going to do it the most straightforward way that I can possibly think of. And that is I'm going to put an alert in there. What's an alert? An alert is a little window that pops up that says, hey, this just happened. And in this 
case, I'm just going to put a message that says the user clicked the button. So that's all my function is. The only reason I'm doing this is I'm making sure that this function, that the click event of this function calls this guy correctly. It's amazing how many times I've seen students stare at code that didn't work, thinking that there was a problem with their function, where in reality, they made a little typo like that, let's say, and the button wasn't calling the function at all. So they could stare at the lines of code in the function for a year, and that wouldn't tell them anything about what the problem really was. That in reality, the function simply wasn't being called. So I'm going to go and save this and run it again. Click on the button. I got an alert that says user clicked the button. All right. So yay, the button is wired to my JavaScript. Now I can grab the temperature and do my thing. And I can take that code out if I want to now because I'm, I'm done with it. I can take out the alert. All right. First thing I want to do is I want to convert from Fahrenheit to centigrade. All right. In order to do that, I have to do three things. All right. I have to get the value from the text box. I'm going to put a temperature Fahrenheit so I know what they have to do. First thing I have to do is I have to get the value, value from the text box. I have to convert it to centigrade or Celsius. And then I have to display the result. The things with the double slashes are comments. All right? Those are ignored by the browser. They're simply little pieces of explanation that help me or anyone else that's changing this program understand what's going on, understanding the purpose of the sentences. All right? So why am I doing this? Why am I taking this number and subtracting 32 from it and multiplying it by 5 ninths. All right? That seems like an odd thing to do to a number. Well, that's a formula to convert from, from Fahrenheit to centigrade. All right? So if I have a comment that says convert to centigrade, that makes it clear of what I'm doing. All right? Notice I put the comments in before I've written the actual line of code. That is probably different than many, many classes, or you'll see many people do. Many people write the code and then go back and comment it. Except for what? They don't go back and comment it, all right? Because they got it to work, they're happy, they don't care anymore. Their favorite TV show's coming on, up, whatever, and they're done with it. So commenting out serves really two purposes. You can use it to document your code and explain what you're doing in your code, but you can also use it to plan out your code. All right? So that's another, that's a valuable reason for putting that in. All right. So the first statement I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable. A variable is simply a place to put a value that we can refer to it later. All right? So variables have names. So I'm going to call this one Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit equals what? It's going to equal the value of this text box. So what do I think this statement is going to look like? Fahrenheit equals.
equals what? I like how that little chime just came in. It made it sound like this is a quiz show. <laughs> how do we access the properties of the stuff on the page? By ID. By ID. So what's the statement that accesses things by ID? Document, get element by ID. Document, get element by ID. What's the ID? What is the ID? TXT temp. Now, here's a case where it's not necessarily 100% clear because we don't really have the HTML attribute for it, at least not defined on this. But the value of the text box is in an attribute called, wait for it, value. So what that does is that accesses this text box and pulls a value out of it. Now, why do I have to say dot value? Well, because the text box is what's called an object. Objects have a whole bunch of properties. Think of properties, think of them as characteristics. All right. Text box have style. So they have background color, and they have the color of the text, and they have the font size and all that. Text boxes have the maximum number of characters you can enter into them as a property. There's a whole bunch of properties associated with a text box. So I can't say that Fahrenheit equals document get element by ID txt temp because that's everything about the text box. I'm not interested in everything about the text box. I'm interested in the one piece of information, and that is what is the text inside of it? What is the value? All right. Now, I could go on to write the next couple of statements, but I'm not. I'm going to make sure this worked, that I have this correct. All right? How am I going to do that? How am I going to ensure that I've pulled the value out of the text box correctly? Pardon me? Validation. Well, we're going to do a validation eventually, but I guess I'm not talking about if the user entered it correctly. I'm talking about if my programming code is correct to pull it out. How do I, how can I check to make sure that, gee, that variable Fahrenheit has a value that's actually in the text box? Well, I'm going to use an alert again. Again, you could do this a bunch of different ways, but an alert is quick and dirty and it works. So I'm going to say alert Fahrenheit. And what that's going to do is that's going to show me the value that's in the variable Fahrenheit. And if it matches what's in the text box, I did it right. If it doesn't match what's in the text box, I did it wrong. So, I'll go here, open this guy up, put in 120 degrees, click Calculate. Page says 120. So that part works. What I'm trying to show you is that it's okay to develop things incrementally. Don't try to write the entire, don't try to solve the entire problem all in one swoop. Do a little piece at a time, test out that piece, and then move on to the next piece. All right. Eventually, for example, I'm going to even expand it from this. So I have the ability to convert from centigrade to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to centigrade or whatever. Okay. So that part worked. Next thing I want to do is I want to do the calculation for centigrade. And if I remember right, centigrade equals... Fahrenheit minus 32 
times 5 divided by 9. Well, how am I going to test to see if this worked? Well, I'm going to do an alert with centigrade in it. some ones that I know off the top of my head um, the value. For example, boiling is 212 in Fahrenheit is 100 degrees in centigrade. So if I type in 212 and I click calculate, yeah, page said Z, uh, 100, so that's right. All right, the other one I know is 32 degrees is freezing in Fahrenheit, it's zero degrees in centigrade. The other interesting one is minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit is minus 40 degrees centigrade. All right. So I've tested it enough to know that it's probably correct. All right. Now, the last step I want to do is I want to put my answer there on the page. All right. So. What am I going to do? All right. Somehow I need to point to that ID. Well, we already know how to do that, right? Document, get element by ID, result. What we don't know is we don't know how to put something into a piece of HTML. We've accessed properties of HTML. We accessed the property of the text box, the value of it. But we don't know how to put something in. All right. Now, the way that we can put something in, one way that we can put something in, is through the use of the property called the inner HTML. The inner HTML is simply the stuff between the starting and ending tag, just kind of like you might expect. So, I can say document get element by ID. Result dot inner HTML equals centigrade. Now notice again, and, and this is confusing for some people, why the word result is in quotes and centigrade isn't. If it's the name of a variable, it's not enclosed in quotes. If it is simply a value of something, and it's a string value, it is enclosed in quotes. Notice that because I've put this code in a function, I don't have that issue of, what do I want to say? I don't have that issue of uh, needing the single quotes inside and the double quotes on the outside. I can just always use double quotes. So let's go and refresh. And I could put in 212 Fahrenheit is 100 degrees Celsius. Yay. 32 equals zero. I could spruce this up by concatenating something like temperature in centigrade and I could add that on to the value of the variable centigrade again because it's enclosed in quotes of it it's called a literal I'm literally going to get exactly that and then finally centigrade So 123 Fahrenheit is 50 point something in centigrade. Now, last thing I want to do is we could change this a little bit so that we didn't click on this. But 
When the user pressed a key, it would automatically do. In fact, we could get rid of the button altogether. I'm not going to get rid of the button altogether, though. I'm going to leave it in here just to show you both ways now that I think about it. So I could say on key up. equals convert temperature. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to do it based on as the user's typing. So now, if I type in 1, it shows me that 1 degree Fahrenheit is negative 17. If I type in 10, it's negative 12. 100 is 37. 1,000 is 500, and so on. Now, what if I type in really cold as the temperature in Fahrenheit? We're back to asking your Aunt Nan for the answer, right? N-A-N, not a number. In other words, it can't take and do the math on that. Likewise, what if we put nothing in? Oddly enough, if we put nothing in, it treats it like it's zero Fahrenheit. So that is not correct. So what we will do next week is we will expand this to add some validation, to not do the, not do the uh, calculation if I don't have a valid number inside the text box. All right, any questions about this? Um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. I know you used inner HTML in this example. Mm -hmm. Is there any real difference between inner HTML and content, content text in terms of I'm not familiar with content text. Let's take a look what that is. It's just something I came across the last few days. For contact text returns combined text. It's similar to HTML <coughs> in the text content differ in the white space representation and the child node content included. So con serves as a Krauss browser analog of these properties. Okay, you should use it seems to me in reading this yeah content, content text only returns the text that's in it. It doesn't return the HTML. So, for example, if I wanted to set if I wanted to strongly emphasize this, I could put an HTML tag, whereas I don't think that would work based on what I'm seeing on content text. All right. So that would seem to be a difference. If you look through the documentation, when they show the content text, it's showing just the text. It's not showing any of the tags. That's something else I can do, by the way. I didn't intend to go over that now, but might as well, is that part of my output is I can embed HTML tags. All right. Question. Um, so there's no, like, type declaration in JavaScript? No. And no. Uh, in other words, the question is, is I just started using a variable. All right. Um, there, JavaScript is, called, is what's called a weakly typed language, which means that you don't have to um, you don't have to declare a variable as being a certain type, for example, a number or a string or whatever. That actually is not necessarily a good thing because JavaScript looks at the variables involved and kind of guesses what to do. For example, this can be confusing 
if you are concatenating things, right? If you're concatenating, if you're plussing, if you use a plus sign to add strings, it puts first string followed by the second string. If you're doing that with numbers, you want to numerically add 1 plus 1, all right? Whereas under certain circumstances in JavaScript, if it thinks that you have a string, it will take 1 plus 1 and give you 11. All right, one one because it treats them as strings. So JavaScript sort of from context figures out what kind of things these variables are, and it sort of takes your word that you can treat these like numbers. For example, that's the value of a text box. That could be anything. Yet JavaScript is perfectly content for allowing me to treat it like a number. All right, and it's up to me then, at least under earlier versions of HTML to write JavaScript validation to make sure that what gets in there is only a number. So no, there is no, you actually can declare things as a var, um, and you can declare things as a particular variable type, but you can like change the variable type simply by changing the assignment. Other questions? Yes. What do you mean by a field variable? Like, like kind of global. So like if you have like a boolean or something, it can be accessed by all your methods. Yes. You could, you, if you wanted to create a variable that was accessible throughout all your methods, you would put it outside of any individual method. An example of that would be Let's say we wanted to keep track of how many conversions a person did or something like that, where you converted one temperature, you converted two temperatures, you converted three temperatures, you know, something like that. Um, or like on a quiz, you know, maybe, um, maybe for a quiz question, um, it gives you two chances at the right answer, a multiple choice. So I pick A, if that doesn't work. I pick D, and it needs to keep track of how many times I've done it. So yes, you can create global variables like that. Anything else? All right, next time what we'll do is we'll do more form stuff. We'll do things like, for example, um, making it so the conversion goes in the other direction as well using either like a radio button or a drop down or whatever. And then we'll put in code validation that will say, hey, make sure that there's a valid number in there before you actually do the calculation. And then more fun. All right, we'll see you in lab.